Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Granville Exempted Village School District Board of Education meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call the roll, please. Dr. Corman. Here. Ms. Deeds. Here. Mr. Janice. Here. Mr. Camilla. Here. Mr. Kahn. Here. Accommodation? Yeah, it's accommodation. Sorry. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. This is the accommodation section of our board meeting. Uh, this year, seven GHS students have been recognized by the National Merit Program. Three Granville High School students have been recognized by the National Merit Scholarship Corporation for their high scores on the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. Sounds pretty important. Uh, they qualified as National Merit Semifinalists and will apply to earn finalist status this year. Congratulations to Nicholas Maxwell, Alexis Beck, and John White. So those three can come on up and stand up here for right now. And now semifinalists are among the highest scoring entrants in Ohio. Those who reach finalist level will be notified next February, and National Merit Scholarship winners will be announced beginning in April 2018. Congratulations and good luck. We also have four high school students who were, who were recognized as National Merit Commended Scholars for their outstanding academic promise after taking the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test known as the PSAT. Congratulations to Daniel Bellafato, Catherine Gross, Kate Guiney, and Nick Havitt. Please come on up. We're talking about literally the top 3% of the country that takes this test. So you're looking at our, our academic finest right here. So we're, we're very proud of them and congratulations. So I have Nick, your um, letter of commendation, and you will get yours at the end when you're finished with the finalist process. So, um, but I also have your award of excellence. Congratulations. 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 Okay, Ryan, are you taking the pictures? I am definitely not the brightest one in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. All right, thank you. Okay, we've got one in the I promise Beth that we do one, but I guess I'm done right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Congratulations. We also recognize some staff members, and tonight we're going to recognize uh, Granville Middle School science teacher Catherine White, also a mom over there. Uh, she was one of 15 educators selected for the first Sidome Academy at the Works. Um, if you're not aware, they're building this huge planetarium next to the Works. I was there today, and they're they're cranking on it, so it looks pretty good. During this year-long professional development program, CAP will explore NASA resources, collaborate with scientists at the Glenn Research Center, and connect student learning to current NASA mission objectives. The Sidone Planetarium, an immersive science facility, will open next June. Congratulations, Kat, and I know that you will represent Granville very well. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I visited 
visited uh, Kat's classroom and uh, they were doing the phases of the moon and using Oreo cookies. And I've never seen kids more excited <laughs> learn about the phases of the moon. So congratulations. Okay. That concludes our... Not quite. Um, we have one more. Well, uh, I just watched my wife walk yeah. in, so I'm thinking something's up. <laughs> I'm either really in trouble or... <laughs> okay. so, um, we want to take a minute to recognize Jeff Brown, and he didn't know that we were going to be doing right, this, yeah. and um, if he did, he would probably have objected. Yeah, I <laughs> um, nonetheless, we want to recognize Jeff for receiving the Jerry Clinky Distinguished Service Award from the Buckeye Association of School Administrators, which is Ohio's Superintendent Association. This award recognizes a person who has demonstrated a commitment to furthering public education and a profession of the superintendency. Here is what was said at the award ceremony. Today we recognize a person who has influence as an advocate for his elected officials, who shares his knowledge and experience with colleagues, and who has now, for several years, represented superintendents on the State Educators Standards Board, where he has been the lone appointee representing school administrators. He has been a strong advocate there and a voice that, if not present, would have left many important issues and insight uncommunicated and unrepresented. His courage to carry the message has had a true impact on our profession. So just to give you a few ideas of the things that Jeff has advocated for and continues to advocate for are things like fewer standardized tests for students, a better accountability system that, among other things, gives districts the ability to use tests that will benefit students, a more effective and efficient teacher evaluation system that will maximize improvement and professional growth for teachers, um, as well as education policies that are not one-size-fits-all for all districts across the state, so the districts do not have to spend time documenting and doing paperwork regarding issues that are not necessarily relevant to their districts. All of these issues have been and continue to be important for improving not only the quality of education we provide here in Granville, but also public education in Iowa in general. I'll finish by noting that Jeff does all of his advocacy and leadership work at the state level in addition to his day, um, <coughs> excuse me, his day job leading Granville schools. And he doesn't do it for compensation or recognition but because it's oriented doing what is best for students. So on behalf of the board, congratulations, and thank you for all you do for Randall Schools and public education in Ohio. Thank you. And this is the award that he received last week at the um, meeting. So. All right, thank you. Something that I think garners a lot of attention 
from the members that are making decisions. So um, it's my honor. I love what I do. I thank the board for the ability to do that that work. And I will not pull a, you know, there's always that TV show that someone's getting an award and they don't recognize their wife. <laughs> I will recognize the fact that um, I can't do what I do without the support of my family because there are many nights where they don't see me. And so um, I appreciate that support as well. So um, yes, I did know you were going to do that. In fact, I didn't even recognize it was not in my office. <laughs> it shows you how observant I am. But, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so we are going to now move into the staff report. So if you were here for accommodations, you can leave. So, um, but Amy, let me give you. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Well, she's, she's a very busy woman. She's busy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. St yeah. Student Our report. Student report. Ethan. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ethan Shaw, I'm the student by president of DHS, and it's kind of hard following up all those awards. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing is I can still pull rank on all the high schoolers. <laughs> I'm trying Mr. Brownhead. But that's, so, uh, that's right. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, word to the wise. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, it's been an exhilarating last couple of weeks, and by exhilarating, nothing really has happened. Uh, it's been kind of a short turnaround. Uh, fall sports have kind of been wrapping up the regular season. Uh, the fall music um, concerts, fall music concerts were a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those went well. And also regarding music, the band is doing their Circleville Pumpkin Parade uh, on October 19th. And we're just having that transitional period with fall activities starting to wrap up before we kick into gear for the winter. So, good things are to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Next, I am. We're gonna have Mr. Durst come up, and um, I'm gonna tee up his presentation by um, going back a couple of years ago around the conversation about. Uh, the whole child. So when I first came to Granville, we talked about not only having a world-class academic experience for students, but we would look at uh, the whole child, looking at social, emotional, um, and physical well-being of our student base and the opportunities that fit those um, aspects of uh, quality. And so we've had a whole child committee for over six years. and. Uh, Throughout that process, they've been dedicated to really looking at student well-being and creating healthy messages to send out to our, our uh, parent base and our students. And they've looked more broadly at, at that notion of well-being. Uh, recently, we've been having conversations around um, substance use. And we, of course, took a four-prong approach, which was looking at the drug curriculum. Um, and, and making sure that we had a curriculum that was K-12 that heavily involved the parent base. Um, we looked at the data sources that we were using at the time. At that time it was Pride. You're going to see some different data tonight. Um, we, looked, we talked about culture and we talked about um, the substance use prevention policy. So all of those were kind of also byproducts of that notion of well-being. But the cultural aspect really was uh, looking at that notion of trying to be um, the the culture of the organization of the of the Granville schools really supporting um, protective factors and looking at uh, 
all the things that we can do in the short term and long term to really impact uh, students differently than um, some of the other tools that we were using. So one of the byproducts of that conversation was we should put together a state of the students report and look at how students are doing in our schools. You know, as, as much data as we can collect or as many sources of data as we can use. So uh, Mr. Durst has been tasked with um, putting together some of the information around the state of the students. What I will tell you is this is the first one. And as always, uh, we will, this will evolve like all of our presentations do. We've always had a very strong uh, state of the schools from an academic standpoint that Mr. Bernath shares. Uh, whether it's internal metrics or external, this will probably um, lead to the same type of critical look at our, our well-being of our student population. So I've given you enough time, Mr. Durst, to cue it up. So uh, it's all yours. That was great. Thanks. Um, good evening, uh, Ward. It's, it's good to be back in front of you to walk through uh, this first edition of the State of the Students. Um, and like Jeff said, I, I would encourage you um, as we walk through this to jot down questions. Um, obviously, feel free to bounce those off of me as we're moving through it. Um, and then even reflect on this as we leave the meeting uh, you know, tonight and into the weekend. Um, and if there is a desire to see um, or to explore different areas that are not uh, looked at in the presentation, um, you know, again, like Jeff said, this is going to be a little bit of a living um, document or living report here um, until we really get into what we think um, is most pertinent or important to us. Um, as, a, as a parent um, and also as an educator, um, I think I echo a lot of your uh, philosophy and your position when we would communicate that academics are definitely a priority for us. Uh, but some of the information that we're going to walk through tonight um, begins to um, edge right next to that academic performance um, because it does deal with the wellness holistically of our students. Um, and so we will walk through some information tonight that will cause you to raise your eyebrows. Um, but uh, I don't want to uh, be flowery um, or rose-colored. Uh, I want to just be honest um, and walk through the data. Um, and then we can uh, monitor, evaluate, um, and adjust our course of action if we need to. Um, so with that, um, real quickly, and, and Jeff alluded to this, but the, the real purpose behind um, what we're doing with the State of the Students report um, is twofold. The, it's designed to communicate the pulse of our students based on data. Um, a, lot, a lot of the time we have very qualitative experiences that are hard to quantify. Uh, and so really, this is a look at trying to bring, in the numerical sense, that qualitative experience of our students. Uh, we started that project, like Jeff said, six years ago, when we began the first round of exit surveys. Uh, we've polished those and modified those to a point where um, we're, we're happy with the way the questions are written. Uh, we believe they're understandable to the students at the different grade levels, they're age appropriate, um, and they really yield good information for us um, that we use to direct some of our actions. Um, additionally, this will serve as a baseline um, or a set of baseline information that we will use for measurement and evaluation. We're really looking at three different sources of information as we walk through um, the presentation tonight. Um, the first being the exit survey results that we mentioned. And just as a reminder, um, those are given as students exit a building. So grades three when they leave the, the elementary school, grade six as they leave the intermediate, grade eight, and grade 12, you know, as they exit the middle and the high school buildings. Additionally, the OES uh, was new to the district last year. Prior to that, it was the Pride Survey. Uh, the Pride Survey focused primarily on substance abuse and violence. And the OES is much more comprehensive. Uh, we, we went through a review of that uh, probably late last winter, uh, well, actually two winters ago, uh, prior to the first administration of it in November of 2016. Um, like I said, much more comprehensive than the Pride Survey um, and provides us with a wide variety of information. So let's set the stage uh, and we'll identify the greater context for our students. So this is a, a quick look 
primarily at exit survey data. Um, this one comes, uh, this is just EMIS data that's reported to the state. Uh, these are the attendance percentages from each of the buildings um, as of last year. So this is the 16-17 uh, school year. So you see here that you know, you've got 95-96% attendance um, across the board all the way through the district. I think we can confidently say that students in Granville attend school on a consistent basis. Um, that's going to be an expectation for us, but I want to assure you um, that that is a luxury for our teachers because not every district in the state of Ohio is able to put these types of numbers on the board. Um, so I understand that it's an expectation and we shouldn't make too great of a deal out of these numbers, but if we consider the importance of them, this means that 95% of the time, kids are in their seats in a classroom where they can receive the quality instruction that the teachers deliver. That makes a significant difference for us um, as we move through the rest of the presentation and look at the different numbers. What, what so what constitutes attendance? Like, you know, lack, lack of absences or? Correct. Okay, so like they attend 95% of the school year? Correct. Okay. Yep. Overwhelmingly, students feel physically safe. Um, and I believe that one of the reasons that they attend such high rates is because they feel physically safe um, and they also feel emotionally safe. Um, these, these two slides really um, are quite connected, but they're also independent of one another. Physical safety is very different from emotional safety. Um, however, when you dovetail them and you start to connect them with the attendance rates, you see the, the correlation there. They feel safe and supported in, in our buildings. In addition to feeling safe and supported, they feel connected. Um, and this is a slide of information that we take great pride in. Because each building works very intentionally to establish relationships and make connections with our students. Um, the board has heard over the past 12 to 18 months from each of the building principals about the different ways they are working to increase connections, develop relationships. Um, I think about the Mike program at GIS uh, as the classic example of one that we, we all heard and benefited from understanding what um, Spurs and the staff out there are doing. Um, so without, without a doubt, students feel comfortable talking with the adults in the building. Additionally, students believe that school um, is a positive experience. Now you can see there that at the high school level, we don't have an equivalent question um, we will tweak that this year on our exit survey so that we have that comparison point. Um, and I want to point this out. One of the reasons that our schools are not plagued by things like bullying, harassment, and suspensions um, is because our students do see schools as a positive experience. They're connected to adults. They feel safe. They are challenged academically. Um, as I said before, we're far from perfect. I don't want to paint the wrong picture here. Bullying happens when it happens then we work with students and families and we resolve it. Suspensions happen, but it's the, it's the exception. It's not the norm. Um, statistically speaking, our bullying and suspension numbers are such that they would not even represent a data point because the end size is so small when you look at it statistically. So again, it happens. Yes, I don't want to paint the wrong picture, um, but it's minuscule in comparison with uh, the way these results look. And finally, in terms of context, our students are incredibly involved in extracurricular activities. This number includes only school-based extracurriculars, and I want to clarify that because it does not include activities that operate independent of the school district. So we all know plenty of uh, students who are connected to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church youth group. You know, the, the list is very long um, when we talk about the activities that students are connected with outside of the school, in addition to this 85% inside of the school. Um, here's the context, just a quick summary. They attend school at a high rate. They feel emotionally and physically safe here. Uh, they are connected to adults and to activities. In a perfect world, this is when I, I leave. <laughs> because we've got a really, really nice picture um, of what the student population looks like. Um, but again, I don't want to mislead. And so in light of the positive context, our students do face challenges that are typical of every other student in America. So we're going to walk through some of those challenges. Matt, is that just the high school? No, that's middle school, high school. Middle school, high it's school. It's 12 yeah. This is not going to be surprising to you that our students feel stressed at school. This has been a topic that we've talked about in the past. Notice 
that the third grade year and third grade guarantee kicks in for GES as they exit that building. You see a decline in the sixth grade, but then as classes begin to, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna send the message that classes don't count in grades kindergarten through eighth grade, but you can see that as students move up into college preparatory, this is going on my transcript courses, the stress level rises, okay? Now, we've talked about the stress level, and we've had conversations about what do they do with that stress. This is where OES moves in in a very nice way. Because what OES does is they give students options for responses. So it's an if-then. If, if you're feeling a high level of stress, then what do you do? And so they populate this with uh, options for students to choose. Now, each one of these options was answered significantly by the students. When I say significantly, I don't want you to, to understand that as 75% of the students are saying yes to physical activity. This is 35%, 40%, 20%, but it's more than an end size of less than 15, which wouldn't, it wouldn't even ping um, on the results. So what we've got here are different management strategies that our students have indicated in grades seven through 12 that they're using these things to cope with stress. This is great, okay? Because we all know stress is not going anywhere. Stress stays in our lives as we move on. The idea that they know how to cope with them, that's the critical piece that we wanna make sure is happening for our students. So I like seeing these types of responses and the percentages that we saw. Do you have a sense on the previous slide kind of what drives those stress levels? Is it academic performance? Is it you know other parent expectation? Is it social? How, how do we like right. drill down on that like I'm stressed so we to can figure out sources? Out. Yeah, we, we can, and I'll make a note of that, but we can tease that out at that level um, through those OES results. Oh, okay. Um, so so we, we'll, we'll get that information. Matt, what are we doing, and maybe we are, uh, to get at defining what that stress is, that level of stress to where it's nervousness or the opposite end, you know, incapacitating. Are we, are we able to measure that at all? Let, let's keep going and then I think, you'll, I think you'll appreciate where we go with some of the next pieces and I think it'll answer some of that question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another challenge that our students face is sleep. Our, our kids do not go to bed. Um, they are busy. <laughs> and they are occupied. And so what you see here, these are the numbers of students who actually get more than eight hours of sleep per night. Now, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics wants to see our kids somewhere around eight or nine hours per night. Um, I know I shoot for six and a half, and, I'm, and I feel great when I get it. And so I, I can identify with, with what our students are walking through here. Um, through the whole child committee, we did start targeting this idea of sleep um, with our messaging, I would say two years ago, um, we really started to, to push messages out to parents about this. I think that's definitely, um, it's necessary obviously for that to continue. Um, it's something that we are talking more intentionally about with students as well. Um, as we take a look at this whole picture of wellness, it's very difficult to pull one wet spaghetti noodle away from the other wet spaghetti noodles. This is, it, it's hard to separate these variables. Um, and so stress plays into sleep, sleep plays into stress. And so th there is a relationship that's very well defined here um, that I think once we start to identify and see results in one area, we start to see benefits in the other areas as well. Uh, by and large, uh, the use of tobacco over the last 20 years um, has declined very, very steadily. And tobacco would be the least of our concerns when it, when it comes to um, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. You can see the percentages at the top there, male at 7.4 and, and female at 3.6. And this really is in response to the question, have you used tobacco? And this could be smokeless, this could be a cigarette, it's any form of tobacco in the last 30 days. Those top percentages, as we'll see on the next several slides as well, those are 712 percentages. So students who answered these questions in the OES survey, grades seven through 12, that's the male and female breakdown. Now, as you look down at the grade level, that's obviously specific to that grade. Um, so you see an increase as you move through, um, you know, through middle school and into high school. These are not terribly different numbers from what we would have seen on the pride survey. 
Um, the, the tough part about a comparison between the Pride survey and the OES survey is the time of, of administration. The Pride survey was always given in May. This survey was given in November. So we can look at the numbers you know, beside each other, but we're not going to assume that there is a direct connection between these two sets of survey results. That's why we said at the beginning, this, this will serve as baseline information for us as we move forward. And you said that would, would that include banking? Yes. Yes. And do we, I know we're going to get into more in different you know, uh, substances, but do we have data on frequency of use as well? So like if you've ever used in the past 30 days, is it like one time, three times? We do. Time? Okay. Because yeah. in, in some in some senses, like I mean, these are low numbers, and I mean, obviously we'd always like to see them lower. But you know, we're, yeah. you know, they're going to. I think it's always going to be there. But we don't know whether this is like I tried it once, right? And then that was it. So we don't know if it's like a habitual thing or not. Or we, we could know if we, we we could know. I don't know if we could define that as habitual based on the numbers, but we would we can generate an idea for frequency. Yep. Yes. This is the one that really gathered so much attention as we walked our way through uh, the drug testing conversation. Um, alcohol and marijuana were really the, primarily the two um, that received the most attention. Again, at the top, the percentages are all students grades 7 through 12 broken down by gender, so male and female. As you move through, again, you're seeing specifically the grade level. Um, and again, the question that generates this response is, have you used any form of alcohol in the last 30 days? There are questions that measure, have you engaged in binge drinking over the last 30 days? Um, frequency, so we, again, we can tease those things out, um, but in terms of the comparables with what we would have had before, this is the comparable question to what we would have had. I, I think one of the things, and we're going to reference it at the end as far as next steps and things to do, but a lot of the deeper dive into this data is probably going to be done during the well-being task force conversation. So if we have a specific target area, then we're going to dig deeper into that data to see if there's something that informs whatever strategy we, we attempt to change the trajectory of those numbers. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Ms. Deeds, I misspoke on the tobacco. The tobacco is cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco, snuff, or dip. So it does not include vape. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I did not see any. I will definitely go back and look. Out of 111 questions, they have to be in there. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No um, I thought this was just a, one of those curious statistics. Um, I'm always, as a high school principal, I'm always interested in getting to the root of things um, because sometimes we see we we see the bad behavior once it's blossomed. Um, and so how do you go back to the root? So I was very intrigued by the age on average of the first consumption of alcohol. The leading category, the leading age bracket there is 15 to 16 years old. Well, what happens when you're 16? You start driving, um, followed by 13 to 14 years old. And you can see that I've got the comparisons there broken down by gender. So we can definitely say to our parents, between the ages of 13 and 16, that's when our, the majority of our students are indicating that they started or at least they tried alcohol for the first time. Um, to me, that's extremely valuable as I go into a freshman orientation with parents um, because I can really speak from Granville-specific data and, and help parents understand that I need you to be really, really uh, having a healthy mistrust of your students, freshman and sophomore years especially, uh, because that's when we're seeing this stuff start. That's when the behavior begins. Do we have any context as to the well, the context in which they tried alcohol for the first time, could this be a family wedding? Could it be, you know what I mean? Like, so sure. like my parents, I'm 16, I'm at a family wedding, my parents let me try alcohol for the first time, had a glass of champagne for the first time. So some of that could be mixed up in this as well. So it's not necessarily with peers, or we, do we know that? Do we know if they first tried it with peers? Right, or? There, there's actually a series of questions that talk about, you know, how it was obtained, it, did a parent give it to you, did a friend give it to you, was it purchased at a store? Okay. So yeah, we can okay. use that out too. Okay. I was 13, I was white, that's how Yeah. Again, with marijuana use, this is last 30 days. Um, the top two, again, are seven through 12 percent, and then you see the specific grade levels underneath. 
Uh, this is very consistent. I want to say, and I don't want to quote the wrong number, but I want to say that we were somewhere between 21 and 24 percent um, on that most recent Pride survey at the senior level, at the senior year. So uh, this is, it's not too dissimilar from what that was. Um, again, I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent, it just in terms of, of our ability to look back historically um, at, what that, at what that number has been. You can see there that at the bottom, the prescri prescription drug examples include Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, Codeine, Adderall, Ritalin, or Xanax. And I want to clarify that with tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, the question is past 30 days. This question is lifetime misuse. Okay, so they don't view prescription drug use through that 30-day lens. They view this as used one or more times in my life. So you're going to see a different comparison point here. It's just it's hard to go apples to apples with marijuana use versus prescription drug use because of that, the way the question is worded. Does this take into account if they had a prescription for that drug? Um, it does because it talks about misuse. So yeah, that their term. You can have a prescription and misuse the drug. You have. Correct. I'm just wondering if that would count as a misuse. Yes. I so if, if I have an, a prescription for Adderall that's one pill a day and I take it two times a day, that's misuse. I think the other piece to note on this slide is that in the Pride survey, it was around nine percent. So this is something that is a little bit more of a red flag Correct. for us to say, okay, these numbers are a little bit more notable yeah. than on the Pride survey. Was the question very similar on the Pride survey? I will, I will confirm that. I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. I will confirm that. Now, as a former school counselor, this is, these are the numbers that, that pull at my heart. And these are students who are saying that they have seriously, <coughs> excuse me, seriously considered suicide during the past year. Um, and you can see there um, that it's really all over the board. It's, a, it's an interesting drop to junior year. Everyone typically thinks junior year is the worst in terms of high school because it's that, it's that last push before the, the transcript is ready to go to colleges in the fall of the senior year. So it's an interesting number to see 5.4 up there being lower than, for example, the sophomore year. Um, this is one, again, that we will, we will keep our eyes on very closely. Um, there's an interesting connection here with the next slide. I saw a healthcare provider for a mental health problem within the last year. So roughly one in four of our students is receiving some type of mental health support from a professional. So I, put, I just laid those down side by side for you. And again, I don't want to communicate a let's not worry about a message. I, I am concerned by the suicidal number. I am reassured by the mental health support number. Um, I, I'm also struck by the mental health number, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, to acknowledge that one in four of our students um, is, is seeking professional help for mental health support, um, I, I wouldn't have guessed that it would be that high. Um, one in ten. I, I, if you would have told me ten percent, I probably would have. I wouldn't have fought, you know, that stat. But one in one in four did that. That jumped out at me um, as being higher than I thought. Not in a bad way. I mean, I think it's that. That's productive. That, that's a great um, avenue for our students. I just wouldn't have guessed that it would be that high. Mr. Durst, just yeah. from your perspective, um, you know, thinking about junior year and senior year, um, junior year, although very difficult, is a year of anticipation because you're applying, you're, you're preparing for that college application process and thinking about your future. And then, you know, senior year is okay, I have, I, I have that information now, and now I'm, you know, making that, I've made that decision, or most likely made that decision, and I'm moving on. Um, I'm really interested in that discrepancy, you know, between junior and senior year, um, and the notion of hope. 
um, because I think we have a lot of research from Gallup that says if kids have hope, they have a higher likelihood of being successful, not only in completing four years of college, but in success in life. So I, I think that's something that I'm really interested in learning more about. I, I think one of the compelling pieces with that 18.6% is that we have prescribed our transitions for our kids until senior year. As you exit third grade, you know you're going to the intermediate school. There's no question about what you're doing. The same is true from sixth to seventh. The same is true from eighth to ninth. It's a known. And so this is the first time that students are being faced with the opportunity to choose. I say opportunity um, because that's a more optimistic word to use. <laughs> I could see a student viewing that as a very daunting decision because it's the first real decision of the transition that they have had to make in life. I am, I am equally curious with you about that junior to senior. I'm not optimistic that we could get it, but I would love to see senior to freshman year in college because the transition is something that oftentimes brings um, untended mental health issues that are kind of the current um, they're underneath the surface, to the surface. And so I would be curious to see what that number starts to look like in that freshman year. At the end of the day, what it comes back to is that we have got to graduate students with the ability to cope or identify resources with these issues. Like we said, stress is not going away. Um, if someone is anxious, they're not going to, you know, immediately be without anxiety when they graduate from high school. So do they know how to access resources? Do they know how to use coping strategies and coping skills? Um, I think that's what we're going to start to see as the next evolution of this. Um, Can I say, I think that eighth grade number sorry. is troubling as well. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether, um, do you guys think that's because they're moving from eighth to ninth grade and there's that kind of hesitation of entering high school? And I don't know. I'm, Help me many a day, but it's a hormonal <laughs> issue too, and kind of becoming an adult or looking. I don't know how you explain that number. So it's almost as bad as the talk right now. Correct. I, I don't have an explanation for it. To be perfectly honest, I, th there are so many factors and variables that contribute to that number that I I don't want to pretend to know um, the source of it right now. Um, but it it does give us an ability to say, okay, if we're going to apply resources. Exactly. Yeah, let's think about eighth grade and what's going on there. Yeah. Um, is there a way to, uh, just in your sense, about different classes have different kind of uh, attitudes and sure. things like that? I wonder how much is just coincidental class variation. If you'd done it one year before, the numbers would all be shifted up yeah. one? Or if That's there's some way from the pride data in general to look at other schools and see if that happens, or if you're just sense of being around the kids. Yeah. I, I don't want to move in a comparison way from pride to OES. I think what we want to really follow for the next four years, like, like think about that seventh grade class, that they're our first number on the board. And so as they move to eighth grade, they'll take it this November, November or December. As they move to ninth grade, they're going to take it again. To me, that's, that's where we start to get rich data, is when we can follow a class as they make their way through um, our district. I hate to answer that way because it's, it means that we need to slow down and monitor rather than jump in and try to help. Not that we're not jumping in, we'll talk about that in the next slide, but we need to pay attention to the way this moves through the system. Um, it's hard to say, boy, I wonder what these 12th graders would have answered like as sophomores, because we just didn't have the OES as an instrument during their sophomore year. So we, we can't say they've gotten better, they've gotten worse, we don't have the, the ability to do that right now, but we will um, as we continue to use this. Um, We've had a, a number of really productive conversations with the folks at OES. It was hard to get the data. It was later than normal, um, much later than expected. Um, I mean, essentially, I've had about two weeks to look through 111 questions to do this. Um, so your questions about can we tease out more data, those are great questions with me because they're questions that I'm wrestling with just the same. Um, so we will do that. Um, as we look at this next slide, this really is the summary piece here, okay? Our students attend at a higher rate. Our students feel safe, they feel supported, they feel connected, they have positive experiences, but they face challenges. We identified sleep, stress, substance abuse, mental health. We talked quickly about four challenges that they face, okay? So the to-do list looks like this. 
we will continue to implement uh, the drug testing program and the newly adopted K-12 uh, substance abuse curriculum. That, that, this year is the first time that we have had coordinated scope and sequence for a substance abuse curriculum, at least since I've been here. I can't speak to prior to that. Um, so we need to let that do its job. We talked about really teaching coping skills. That's the beauty of what the, the curriculum looks like. It, it's not a dare program that says just say no. It's a life skills program that develops skills in these students that impact substance use, but they also have carryover effect. So this will be great to see. So first, we implement. Second, we monitor. We have to keep an eye on what these survey results look like on a year in year out basis. And then finally, we increase awareness. Um, like I said earlier with, with my freshman orientation example, I now am armed with information that's Granville specific. It's one thing for me to speak in generic statistical terms with a group of parents. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I can bring it down to the Granville level and say our students are telling us this, that's very powerful and that leads to rich conversations. Um, so through the whole child committee, through the well-being task force, um, you will see different things spin out of um, this information as a result of the data. I I'm happy to answer questions. I'm not going to pretend like I know the answers, though. So if you ask me a question <laughs> that I need to go get the answer for, I will definitely make a note of that. One thing I noticed with the substance use um, is that the big jump between 10th and 11th grade. And that's a pattern we also did see with you know, I'm not a fan of the Pride survey data, right. but that is a similar pattern. Um, and it actually almost doubles for every substance that we look at. So I would, I would say that that's probably another, um, if you're going to apply resources somewhere, I mean, that's a pretty stark pattern that we see um, in the data. And, you know, what are some of the reasons that might be, you know, well, pretty much everybody's driving by then, you know, there's a lot more, you know, less supervision probably from, um, because they're out with their car, whatever, you know, but um, I just noticed that in the data that there is that jump. So I, I want to compliment the board on a, at a couple of different levels. First of all, we are, my dad would say, showing warts, okay? You know, in an intentional manner, saying, listen, I thought May Matt framed it beautifully. There are a lot of positive things that we can talk about, okay? But we also know that there are some things that are indicators that we need to do some more work in areas you know we're doing that with with Craig in the room you know intentionally but it's okay to share this information because I think it's part of the transparency that will actually lead to productive outcomes it's the same conversation that we had around st student academic performance you know we talked about the illusion of excellence at my at the beginning of my career and now we talk about you know the fact that we we own that level of academic performance of our students because our internal metrics show us that we focus on every single child. Um, and so I applaud you for encouraging us to look at this information a little bit more deeply and making it something that's public because a lot of times that's the most scary thing to do um, because you know somebody can twist it but I applaud you for doing that. So um, it also will lead to very good work in the future. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I, I mean, public, but also like, I don't know how we can create the intentional conversations amongst families, right? Because families are sort of like working together with this in this extent, right? Like, I mean, is this something that we should have posted in a way and intentionally linked to, right? So that, you know, families that choose to can walk through these things, right? I mean. Those suicidal numbers are big, right? Like, and I guess if you were to ask families, you know, how many of you think your kids have considered suicide, right? Those numbers might be different than the ones that the students report themselves. Same with the, you know, substance abuse and so forth. So I don't know how to like use either this presentation or what the right format is to get get families to engage amongst themselves to have the conversation because I think that's where a whole lot of progress is made. <laughs> In, in you know sharing values and things like that I'm not sure what that format looks like I don't know how you post it in a way or send it home in a way that's you know made aware 
Um, but I think that's really key, you know, being open and honest about it, just so people's eyes are open a little bit. You know, I was surprised by some of the statistics and things like that. I think that's really useful. Mm -hmm. Really, that's the way that we make progress. But I think they are open to it. If one in four kids are going to a mental health professional, yeah. The yeah. parents know, I think, mm -hmm. and I'll drop a Granville truth right now, mm -hmm. people don't want to think, other people to think that their family is fallible, right? So we have one in four kids going to see a mental health professional. They're not going to go to their next door neighbor and say, just saw the therapist and, ooh, the suicidal number is crazy. So, yeah. I mean. That's a good point. Right. Yeah, it's there. I think it's there, the help and the mm -hmm. recognition is there, but it's not being shared maybe mm -hmm. in a way that is beneficial to help other parents. Right. If I knew that my next door neighbor's kid was going to see therapy, well, maybe I'd send my kid to go see a therapist right. too, but. So maybe I think there might be mm -hmm. many layers to yeah. Oh, yeah, for that sure. kind of figure. But the out. fact that there's twenty uh, a quarter of our kids see a therapist, it's like, oh wow, it's not just my kid. He's not the like only right. one that's got these problems, right? And I think that helps kind of bring these things right. out. And I'm not sure right. how that's done in a in a positive, constructive way, right? But certainly, it's you know, uh, it's great to see that kind of engagement. And if we can find a way that it's accepted, you know. And, and you know that the conversations that we have are reinforced. That's that's a good point. Yeah. The, the the last thing we ever want a parent to say is, "I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't have the resources available to me." Because I think that's the the biggest crime. You know. So mm -hmm. you know, I think that is a very good indicator that people are reaching out to the resources that are available. But I I also know that one of the things that our guidance counseling department really prioritizes it is that notion of a resource bank uh, that they can point parents to at the right times um, so I think that's really important we, we will have a report that comes out right I mean there's going to yeah. be a formal like yeah report that well so a couple of things I think yes and maybe a little later, because I think the most important piece is really getting into the well-being task force conversation mm -hmm. and really digging into that information a little bit more intentionally. And then a byproduct of that being kind of the the aggregate report. Okay. So, yeah. No, I, great analysis. Yeah. And uh, the numbers are sobering, as, you know, as others have observed. It's, I think it probably confirms some of what we thought or feared or were concerned with. Um, and I will tell you, in, you know, I've lost track of how many years I've been on the board now, but in my tenure on the board, this well-being task force is the single most important initiative we will undertake. Um, we, we have a set of numbers. We will continue to supplement that with uh, additional studies, um, but I think you know, what we know is there is a challenge and an opportunity, and it requires everybody to uh, you know, to really dive in. One thing that was encouraging, we've talked a little bit on the Wellbeing Task Force about you know bringing in folks involving students, involving parents, involving staff, uh, involving um, mental health professionals. You know, that was highlighted. The need for that was highlighted by the statistics that one in four kids are receiving some sort of support from a mental health professional. To me, that's a, there's a huge resource out there then of, of folks, some in our community and, and the broader community that, that we can draw in hopefully to mm -hmm. provide um, some additional insight into yeah, what point. these challenges are and how we should address them. So I know, that, uh, I know that's the plan with yeah. the Wellbeing Task Force, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I will tell you, I, you know, there's nothing that I think is more important right now than what we're doing in that that initiative. Great. That's a good point. Thank you. So we're actually going to dovetail right into the next presentation, um, which is kind of the, um, unfortunately, by moving the uh, board meeting date, uh, Ms. Mrs. Postal, who was going to give this presentation with some students at the middle school, they didn't have the change of time. So I'm going to give their presentation, and I know I won't do it. Uh, justice. So, um, you are going to um, be uh, in several minutes um, faced with an action item around a therapy dog at Granville Middle School. 
I'm going to take you back to the report. Uh, on the, the slide that talked about emotional safety, the middle school's number dropped down to 81%. That was the lowest across the entire district. Um, Mrs. Postal has been looking at ways <coughs> to uh, look at that number and increase that emotional safety. If you look at uh, middle school in general, uh, kids are facing puberty. Uh, it's, we call it kind of the cauldron of, of hormones um, that are you know, interacting all at one time. Uh, they're, they're transitioning from the intermediate school to the middle school, high school complex. There's a lot of things going on. And I think you see kind of a dip in a lot of the indicators that we look at at that level. So um, at the beginning of the year, Mrs. Postal approached me about, you know, what would we think about um, having a therapy dog at the uh, middle school? Therapy dogs are widely used. Uh, there's one at SeaTac. Um, there's one at several um, district or other districts in Lincoln County and in Franklin County. Um, but I just want to read to you a little bit about some of the things that Misty provided to me. First of all, the benefits, uh, there are cognitive benefits. Dogs can stimulate memory and problem solving skills. The emotional and mental health, a school therapy dog is one of the uh, more uh, positive school connections for students. Interacting with the dog has been shown to lift spirits, increase empathy, reduce anxiety and stress, and increase motivation for treatment in students with depression and life-threatening illnesses. There's a social aspect to this. Uh, visiting with a therapy dog can bring students and teachers together in a shared bonding experience and promote confidence and, and self-esteem in students who connect with them. The presence of an animal can uh, significantly increase positive social behaviors among children uh, on the autism spectrum. There's a physical benefit. Interaction with the therapy dog has been shown to reduce blood pressure, uh, response to emotional stress, increased tactile stimulation, stimulation, and gives motivation to walk, move, and assist with pain management. So all of those are some of the benefits that, that uh, she, she shared with me. And you know, of course, my job is to talk about the risk and the liability and all those kinds of fun things. Uh, and, and so there are some, some challenges to that. You know, there are legal and liability uh, implications, but we have board policy that supports animals in schools. I mean, we have Jim Redding's classroom, um, which has multiple snakes and other things in it. So you know, we've had, we have animals in the, in the classrooms now. Um, supervision of the, of the animal, allergic reactions, potential harm to students and staff. So the, the goal would be to uh, have this dog go through the actual training process of um, becoming a therapy dog. It's very much like a service dog. Not as intense, but very similarly credentialed. So there are uh, you have the Canine Good Citizen course, you have the American Kennel Club, and then there's also the um, OSU Puppy Skills courses that then lead to the international uh, certification process of the, the therapy dog. Um, the, the reason why we're kind of accelerating this process is, you know, Mrs. Uh, Postal wrote a grant to the GEF uh, to support this project. She was granted, I believe, around $700 for the grant. And um, so she has purchased George, okay? Um, and so she is taking ownership of the dog, but really wants that dog to start the process, which means you have to introduce it into the school environment as early as possible so that they get that comfort level of familiarity. So let me talk to you a little bit about the student presentation. So George is a standard poodle. Um, and the, the students put together this little e-maze. I think it's pretty cool. Um, expected benef benefits. The emotional safety, the symptoms of reducing symptoms of anxiety, and increasing school connectedness. Uh, what we want to do is really build momentum around this dog being in the school environment as a resource for students. When she put out a, a survey to the students, you're going to see 118 of our middle school students responded to the survey positively. And we have some of their comments 
um, woven into the presentation. But we had a lot of momentum ar around having this type of uh, uh, support mechanism for our students. Increased emotional safety. You can see that it increases empathy, something that we always struggle with, um, especially in the middle school level, because sometimes, you know, as they're trying to fit in, they make poor choices and pick on stu other students. We want to increase empathy. We want to reduce stress and anxiety. Obviously, we talked a lot about that in the previous report. And then that additional, additional connection within the school day. You know, the one thing that I always talk about when I'm talking about therapy dog is, if you go out to Brindu, who's out at Brindu? Quincy. You know, Quincy is probably the most popular aspect of Brindu <laughs> because he's always out there and people love to pet Quincy. It, it, it gives, it lends credibility to the fact that that, that, that um, an animal can really be the connection for people to, you know, connect with, um, with the environment. And then connecting with and caring for an animal can build self-esteem and confidence in a child's ability to care for self and others. Uh, the hardest part of coming to school is that I miss home. I miss feeling comfortable. I love my dog, and having a dog here would make me feel like I am more at home. That is a direct quote from a student. Decreased symptoms of anxiety. Petting and caring for a ther therapy dog can uh, provide a distraction from feelings of stress and anxiety, encourage movement and play in older students, and reduce psychological, uh, physiological symptoms of stress, including rapid heart or breathing and heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm talking to the board, but we also have a board member whose wife is um, an equine therapist and you, you know works with the animals um, in providing therapy for a significant population of our community. So. I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. <laughs> Susan, I'm sure, would, would be drinking the Kool-Aid right now. You had me at hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm dying to help with this dog. I have no animals, but I would love a dog. They have uh, always put a huge smile on my face and I forget my worries for the day. That's, can I ask questions now? Sure. What is would be an average student's interaction with this dog? So, okay. so like he's walking the halls, and you're like, "Hey, George, how's it going?" Yeah. Or because I know this kid who says, "I have no animal, they'd love to have this dog." Yeah, this dog isn't going to be walking in your classroom and giving you cuddles, right? Right. So, well, it, it depends. So, initial there's like a phase in. Mm -hmm. Initially, the dog will be in Misty's office for direct one-on-one -on -one work. As right. they build a relationship with the different um, teachers then the dog can be more mobile. Um, you're right, it's never going to be, uh, hey, just run around and roam. It's going to be used intentionally. Uh, but it can be in the regular classroom, not just in the guidance counselor's office. So he could, uh, theoretically, at recess at some point, he could be out there and the kids could see him. In the we don't have recess at the middle school. So you see it in the children. The yes. <laughs> You'll get that. But, so, I mean, there's not gonna be a daily interaction with every kid seeing him. Correct. Him. Correct. What I would envision, though, is at the beginning of the day, all the students traverse the, the um, center hall and the project center. I envision, you know, George being in those environments initially, and then, you know, I can, I can uh, very easily envision when a student is struggling, heading to the office, the dog coming to the office, being that healthy distraction in order to get the student to communicate effectively. And so it really will be a research, or resource and a tool to use um, with the student body. Um, increased student connectedness. Um, visiting with a the therapy dog can bring students and teachers together in a shared bonding experience and having a therapy dog in the school counseling office reduces the potential stigma for seeking help. Um, I have a standard poodle at home, so I can definitely help you with George. Maybe we could start a club for students who want to work with him. So again, you know, you'll see that um, 118 students responded, and they are extremely excited. I would, I would um, suggest that if you didn't vote this through tonight, you may have the largest attendance at a board meeting <laughs> in November of students from the middle school level. No. Um, 
But I think the other side of this, uh, once Misty proposed this to me, I went to um, a local vet, uh, Doug Wagner, and said, would you be willing to donate your veterinary services for the dog? And he said, absolutely. Um, I'll do it pro bono, uh, and I will come in and, and work with the dog, work with the students. Um, so I thought that was also another great community connection to a local resource. Uh, so that is what they wanted to share. What I will tell you is your, your approval tonight will lead to a, a lot of other work on our behalf of looking at some of the other aspects of liability. Although we have general liability that covers you know, uh, resources in the schools. So, but we will do our due diligence on all of those other aspects that would we would do typically whenever we make a change in the school environment. Uh, the dog would come to school and go home with, with uh, Mrs. Postal, so it wouldn't be staying there overnight. Um, and then the other thing that they talked about was working through a process where you have the, the dog in service for a period of time and then transition the dog out um, and bring, introduce a new dog in so that you don't have that you know, um, uh, potential trauma of you know, the dog not being there anymore. So you, you plan ahead of time so that they can retire the dog in a ceremony and then introduce a new dog into the, into the environment. So, um, what questions might you have based on the presentation? I, I think it's a really cool concept, that's great. Um, is it legally owned by the school district? It is actually going to be legally owned by Mrs. Postal. Okay. Um, but it will be a resource for us to use. Um, the training, all the training is going to be paid for by GEF. Okay. Great. How much of the training happens before, like, because you had said we're trying to expedite this. Yeah. So that we can get the dog in as soon as possible. Is being in the, the building part of the training, or yes. is it all as the training happened before? Or so there, there are multiple steps to it, um, and there is a an introduction phase where the dog is introduced into the building, but it's not working at that time. It's just a a, a building of the understanding of the environment. It actually takes a year and a half for the dog to complete all of the stages. So we're, the dog won't be actually in service until you know, probably the middle of the 18-19 school year. Okay. And this is a gateway dog, right? So if middle school gets a dog, <laughs> I don't imagine it's going to happen. Yeah, it's yes. going to happen. Yes. Okay. yes, I do understand that that is a potential uh, opportunity. <laughs> well, I, I obviously, if, if if it is an animal, so if you know a dog, the dog is, you know, I mean, she has this dog. If the dog doesn't pass the um, the training pieces, then then the dog won't go into service. Uh, but you know, there's always the threat of you know the dog doing harm, and and that is a potential risk. But again, that's why you do the training and make sure that they're in the right, um, they've been credentialed appropriately, so that we mitigate that risk. Do we have allergy concerns, or that's why it's a poodle? Yeah, that's why it's a poodle. And we will, we will still, you know, obviously we will look at our health concern list and make sure that we minimize any contact with anybody who has allergies. Or phobias, yeah. Yeah. Okay. How old is George now? George is currently eight weeks old. Get reported to the EMIS as a certified or classified <laughs> <laughs> That is a question we will have to pursue.
question actually was going around the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another school had was going through this. That was that kind of at the end, going through the process, and then the end was. And this is better than being certified or classified. <laughs> Okay, we have reached the point in the agenda where we will entertain public comments. If there's anybody who would like to address the board, please um, approach the podium, state your name and address, and speak for three to five minutes. Would anybody like to address the board at this time? Okay. okay. Moving on to uh, board discussion. Like you're gonna, we're going to talk about the levy. We are. Um, and you were going to, you know, provide us with just a you know, summary of what we've done. Uh, yeah, um, just kind of the summary of. Yeah, the last part of the fight forecast that we did last month. Um, yeah, clearly our, we are now spending more money than we are taking in, so we are on the downward slope on the levy cycle. Um, and ideally, if we're going to do something in 2018, um, you know, we we'll need to make a decision, especially if we're going on the May ballot. Um, the if, whether it's an income tax or a property tax, the income tax, because it's a two-step process and a longer process, um, the board really probably needs to make a decision by December. Um, so, because there'll be, have to be a second meeting to actually place the issue on the on the ballot. Um, the property tax is a little bit more time, um, not a lot, um, for all that action to occur. So, you know, we're looking at the levy. Um, the income tax, because of where we are financially right now, um, and because of the amount of time it takes for it to ramp up, it's an 18-month ramp up, um, whereas a property tax is a six-month ramp up. Um, the, you need more lead time with an income tax before you start running into a more severe cash situation. Um, and that really means um, if we go that route, is adopting it in 2018 to become effective on January 1st of 2019 because we can't absorb the slower ramp up of the money um, before we hit the point where there is a cash issue. Um, the reason we're considering the income tax rather than just the traditional property tax that the district has generally done over the last four years. Um, when you look at our property tax rates, uh, we are in the top, you know, less 10% as far as how much our residential taxpayers pay on a rate. Um, there are only 48 out of 609 districts that have a higher tax rate than we do around the state. And in Licking County, only Licking Heights has a slightly higher rate than we do. On the business side, um, there are only 25 districts that have higher rates on business tax payers than we do. And we are by 15 mils the highest rate in Licking County relative to any other district. Um, with the levy having passed last time by 41 votes, um, with no organized opposition and anything that, yeah, I think that's an indication that the taxpayers are reaching a tipping point on absorb being able to absorb more property tax. Um, so I think that that's why we're looking at income tax. Um, you know, we've talked about if, when you do earn an income tax, um, especially seniors, you know, don't have to pay it or don't have to pay much of it unless they are still working. And there's been some concern about burden shifting. But what you have to remember is with the reappraisal we are going through this year and the catching up that is happening um, with property where the owner has been in the home a long period of time, uh, which is more likely to be seniors than anybody else, the seniors are going to feel the brunt of this reappraisal this year. Um, and there will be a lot of burden shifting on our existing levies um, to senior homeowners because while, you know, we're going to end up seeing a 15 to 16 percent increase in residential properties, um, there will be many seniors that will see 20 to 30 percent and even maybe a little higher than that increases in their valuations. And so when the rates go down by 15 or 16 percent, 
they're still left facing any, you know, it could be anywhere from a five to a 15% increase in their taxes. Um, and so that is going to be difficult. You know, for them, it's going to look like a new levy. If you think about the levy that we passed in 2013, that essentially was about an 11 or 12 percent increase in the rate that we had at that point. And so that was, you know, if they're looking at a 10 to 15, you know, 10 or 15 percent increase in their taxes, it's equivalent of having a new levy on them. Um, and so I think we are already seeing the shifting of burden onto them, um, onto seniors especially. And I mean, it's going to affect others as well. There are going to be others in situations where they're getting bigger than averages increases in valuations. Um, but I think it's going to disproportionately be in that group of people. Um, and so with the income tax, and actually it would be with the property tax also, um, we are looking to solve our not only operating but also our capital needs. Um, and approximately two and a quarter mills, um, which is about 5% of our millage, a year following this would fall off the property tax. And that would be under either scenario, whether we did the income tax or whether we did a property tax. And the idea would be to do a property tax that is big enough to allow the two and a quarter mills to fall off the following year. That will, and again, either of those will solve for a, a pretty good period of time um, our operating and our capital needs. Um, one of the things I like about this plan the most is by being able to take inside millage and move that to capital, to the PI, is it gives us a growing source of PI money. And that, you know, we have a lot of long-term needs um, in PI. Um, so to not only get a boost in the amount of money that's there, but then also to have one that at least when we do go through these reappraisals every, or trying to update every three years, if we are seeing a 10, you know, say we got a 10% increase the next time, at least that, that PI fund will see a 10% increase in the amount of revenues um, so helping us keep up with inflation in an area where we really have no control over inflation other than by just not doing projects. Um, because, you know, if we have to pay, replace a boiler today or if we have to replace it five years from now, five years from now it's going to cost more than it's going to cost today. Um, but if the boiler has to be replaced, the boiler has to be replaced. And so having something that grows will help us keep up with um, the inflationary costs. So that's kind of an overview, um, kind of wh why we're at where we're at. Um, first, I guess, any questions you know, out of, from the, the discussion last month um, that anybody has as far as making sure they understand things or have alternatives in that way? Jen, I think you have some questions to kind of stimulate a discussion. Mike, just one question, if you would remind us again remind me again um, you said there's an equivalency if we went a property tax or an income tax uh, to allow us to drop two and a quarter mils off of uh, the rolls in a year from now what, what number would that have to be in a property tax what, what would it, is that nine mils well we're looking at in property tax would probably be nine and a quarter um, income tax would be one and a quarter percent um, that will allow us, that will give us the flexibility then to allow the two and a quarter mills to fall off the next year without harming the, the, um, the fiscal stability um, from the levy running out too quickly. Thank and, you. And hitting the back slope of that levy cycle faster than we would like to hit the back slope of that levy cycle. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of what you've said has come out in our discussions last month. It's come out in the Sentinel. Um, and so I'm wondering, maybe we can start off by, are, are you hearing anything in the community about preferences for a direction that we take? Um, any, any sort of, I don't know, concerns over the size of the levies that we're looking at or um, anything like that? And um, anybody hearing from our constituents yet? 
and it may not be, it may not be yet because we're somewhat early in the process and it's not coming until next May, so it may not be sort of in the forefront of everybody's mind like it is ours, for yeah. sure. So, but I just wanted to sort of start off by seeing whether or not you're hearing anything out there it's, yet. It's kind of surprisingly quiet, right? And, and, but nonetheless, I've been very proactive about talking to people and knock on doors or even, you know, asking people intentionally what their thoughts are on this because most of the people have seen it and it's sort of engaged in it. Um, and I guess, you know, the consistent thing is nobody really likes more taxes, right? I haven't seen anybody that's like, yeah, I raised my taxes, that'd be great, right? <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've heard none of that, <laughs> right? Relative to the income versus property tax, you know, I don't think people are, have kind of run the numbers themselves a lot and fully engaged in a lot. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little sensitive or concerned that it's going to become a forum on income versus property tax instead of a forum on like, wow, the schools are awesome and we do a great job of running them cost effectively, let's pass this levy, right? And I don't know how to either disentangle those or kind of change the focus of it so it's really a conversation about the schools and the value that the schools give, right, as opposed to just kind of up or down, yay or nay, based on whether one or the other is better for you or what you think about it. So I think there's maybe a little risk of not getting votes, even if you're supportive of the schools and you would otherwise be so, if that one slice of the way that we, we tax has some impact. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if, how we kind of manage that through the process. I think communication is really important. I think we've got fantastic messaging. I think we've got a great story to tell in general relative to needing to have a tax levy because that's what we need to do and we have a great product for effective cost. But um, I, I'm worried about that disentanglement to some extent. And, and, and again, people are always worried about the amount, right? And Mike kind of mentioned that tipping point on the amount of property taxes. We only passed by a few votes before. I'm not sure it's the amount of property taxes that people care about. I think it's the amount of taxes that people care about, right? And I think, we, you know, it's, it's just the whole number, right? And, and it's, it's pretty easy to calculate, oh, here's what my salary is, and here's what a percent and a quarter of that is. That, wow, that's a lot of money, right? And, and property taxes are a little more confusing to calculate, right? It's a little bit more of a nebulous number, which is not right. I mean, we, we are very open and honest what that is and what those calculations are. But whether it comes one way or the other, you know, I think that's something that people are going to really have their eyes opened by. Um, and I don't know if the magnitude of it is that. You know, I don't know, you know, if it's better to think about can we do a 1% income tax and try and, you know, renew on some of the others or something like that. I don't know if that one versus one and a quarter is a big deal. One and a quarter sounds to me like a lot more than one because it's kind of that, you know, if you'd, you'd rather run nine and a half than ten and a half, right? It's that kind of funny difference and it's, it's a big number. You know, one and a quarter is, you know, relatively big for a school district income tax. But I'm not sure if that's the thing that is going to push people over the edge to vote for it or against it. So I have not heard a lot. I've been intentionally asking a lot. Um, and people are generally phobic. Um, and we'll see whether it's the income or property tax. And I'm not sure how we get that by the next month. <laughs> right? Well, December. To be, to be or by December, December right? Yeah. But in reality, you know, we'll have to have another discussion next month, yeah. right, well, where we kind of yeah. come to something that we can effectively propose in December. Right? Yeah. Well, that raises a good point. I don't know that we haven't really discussed about one of the strat. I think one of the reasons we were going for the strategy, this strategy, was that we could go to the voters once rather yeah. than uh, a, a vote for the operating and then a vote for renewing. We could just right. do it all in one. Mm -hmm. um, any sense from, you know, you guys about, you know, do you see it bet better to go for the one or perhaps consider a 1% um, um, income tax to, um, and then have to, to go to the voters again, what, a year, year later? A year later? Um, no more. Well, no more than a year later. When is the no more? No more. No more than. Yeah. When is the PI? Um, the PI levy. We would have to renew it by November of nineteen. We'd have a window. Basically, we have three elections. We have November of eighteen, May of nineteen, November of nineteen. We'd have to be on one of those three elections to renew it. Okay. That so we can't go before November nineteen. Okay. Eighteen. Sorry, eighteen. Right. November 18 is the earliest we can do. Okay. November 19 is the latest without risking it expiring. How much is the PI levy of that one and a, two and a quarter percent? It's once the reappraisal is done, I think it's going to be about 1.45 of the two and a quarter. Okay. 
I don't know. A lot of times renewals are a lot easier, right, if it's a small number like that. And I, I hate to run two levy campaigns. They're distracting enough as it is and, and from our you know, core mission and things like that. But I don't know if that's going to fundamentally help people find a way to support this or not. That's know. the kind of questions we've got to start asking a lot of people, right? you know, and, and try and get that yeah. feedback now. Right. Yeah. I mean, my sense is there's voter fatigue, so to have yeah. to go twice is probably a little bit less desirable. But at the same time, I also, you know, some, you know, talking about one versus one and a quarter, people like, you know, they, there, was a little, there was a little, you know, intake, but they didn't say like, no, no, but, you know, um, it, does one percent look that much better than 1.25? And, um, and I don't know, have we done um, any calculations based on a 1% and how that all falls out in terms yeah. of? Yeah, it, it would work, I ran, it would work financially um, based on what we'd be doing. We would, if we did a 1%, renewed the current PI levy, and we could still move a, a mill and a quarter over from, of inside millage over, we would not be able to move the, two, the full 2.75. Okay. That will not work. Okay. Um, but we could move a mill and a quarter to get partially growing le levy. Mm -hmm. um, but we could, but yeah, that we can't do. And it does, I looked in, in the five year forecast, it still gets us to an okay point um, when you get out to 2020, the 21 22 school year, we'd still be at an okay point. From an operating Perspective. From still, an operating but perspective. But we would still have to renew. Assuming yes. we have yeah. the renewal as well. Yes. Yeah. Right. We'd have to or renew again. We'd have to the renew half. the PI, and you know, since we've been talking about a five-year income tax, we would also then, essentially, five years from now, be on the ballot two years in a row again. To with the, to renew both of, to renew both of those. Mike, what's the order of magnitude? The the difference. I don't in terms of money that could be devoted to PI if we did a 1% and then a renewal of the PI levy, that, that has a... It ends up being about the same. Okay. And, and I've sort of structured it that way. Is we end, we end up with about in the same ending spot if we did a 1% with a one and a quarter mil shift. We end, for the amount of money that's in the PI fund, we end up in about the same place as if we let the PI and the other stuff fall off and move two and three quarters. Okay. Over, we, and we'd actually move it over two, we'd actually move the two and three quarters over two years, we wouldn't do it all at once. We would move it to time with the expiration of the PI levy, you know, the second piece of it would be the time with the expiration of the PI levy. And would there, would, if we did that second alternative, would there be any millage that would drop off of property taxes? There would be the, well, the half mill maintenance level we have, that is going that away. Goes. Um, that's going to end up being, that's probably going to be, after this reappraisal, the collection on that's going to be about 0 0.35, 34, something like that. And then, um, you yeah, know, we're expecting to do about, 0.45 on the um, bond levy because of the refunding from 2015 as that starts kicking in. So if we, re if basically, if we went that route and did a 1%, renewed the, P and renewed the PI levy, we'd probably be looking at about a 0.8 mil drop in the property tax rather than two and a quarter. No, that's fine. I think it's all about messaging, too. I, you got to drop words like PI and mill. Yeah, like that's not playing with, I can't walk up to whatever house and say, oh, the PI levy and the five mill. Right. Like, it needs to have concrete. No, it will. It, yeah, I, I, but it's hard to give me an example and say, well, oh, yeah, we should pick this over this because, I mean, it's hard to articulate that with people who are not thinking in those kind of ways. And I think people who are thinking about mills and PI their minds, their mind is set in a different place than ours are. Mm -hmm. Once we make a decision, I, right. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Once the board makes a decision, this is clearly about funding the schools. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, what we're trying to say is, all right, yeah, we're, we're in the sausage making, trying to figure out, okay, what's the right mix? But the bottom line is, the product is the product. If you don't want this product moving forward, 
then, then you're going to make one choice. If you do, then you make the other choice. But it is about the quality of the school district, plain and simple. And that's what that boiling down has to be. Are you, do you appreciate the value that Granville Schools adds to this community and the quality of education that the students are provided? That is going to require your support, plain and simple. That's the, that's the key. We yeah, yeah like, like Thomas, I've been intentional in a number of conversations <coughs> with folks. Um, and it, yeah, there's not a lot of awareness out there. There are some people who say, you guys are going to be on the ballot next year, right? Yeah. Um, the reception, the initial reception overall to a, an earned income tax versus a property tax has been positive. And I've been speaking mostly with folks who are wage earners, some of whom have uh, family members who are non-wage earners at this point, and they, they appreciate the, the benefit there. Um, I think Thomas is, is right. I mean, people are going to run the numbers and make a decision on what they what it looks like, but we're not ultimately putting an alternative on the ballot. Right. 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 Yes. We're going to, as Jeff said, it, it you know it costs what it costs. If we want to do all the things that we do, we think that they're important, and if we you know, if we take some of that away, we, because we have less money, we, we can do that. But ultimately, it's just a function of figuring out what's the optimal way to fund it. I, I have concerns about not just voter fatigue, but frankly, we call on a lot of volunteers to run levy campaigns mm -hmm. and to run two campaigns within an 18-month period. Is, that's asking a lot for folks. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would... Just in that context alone, I'd lean towards running a single <coughs> campaign. Um, but I think there's a, as Andrew said, there's a huge piece of it is going to be messaging. Um, I think I think people expect us to make decisions that are fiscally sound and prudent, and I think we have. Uh, and I think we, we'll make a decision here that is. Uh, that is consistent with that um, and how we fund what we think it's going to cost going forward. And, I, and I'm concerned uh, because our physical costs are, you know, our, uh, our physical plant needs capital. Uh, when the, the newest building in our district is 15, 16 years old now, and the others are considerably older than that. So our, our costs aren't going to go down. And I like the uh, straightforward nature of the earned income tax as a way to address those needs as well as our operating needs. And I think that's a message that we can communicate. And when I've spoken with folks about that, I think there's an appreciation of that. But, you know, it's it's not even a straw poll at this point. It's, well, uh, um, can you give me a sense of um, other districts in the county and in the central Ohio mix of income versus property tax. I, you spoke to our property taxes compared with with right. in Lincoln County, um, Newark, Southwest Licking, Licking Valley, Johnstown, and North Fork all have income taxes. Um, Northridge used to it was not renewed when it came up for renewal. Um, in Franklin County, um, Canal Winchester, Reynoldsburg, and Bexley all have income taxes. Are they earned or within the old income taxes? Most of these are the old one. Newark is an earned one, and I believe Johnstown is an earned one. Um, the others are all from before the law. Bexley, even though Bexley's is not as old, I believe theirs is on all income. Um, and in over in Fairfield County, um, almost every district, there's only two or three districts, two, maybe two districts in Fairfield County that does not have an income tax. Um, they almost all have income taxes. Um, you have the Delaware County and um, Big Walnut and Buckeye Valley both have income taxes. Um, so they are around us. Um, you know, obviously Franklin, there's only three out of the, what is there? 25, 30, 25 districts or so in Franklin County, only three have it. But in the other 
surrounding districts, um, in Pickaway County, I think three of the four districts, I think, down in Pickaway County have an income tax. Is there a pattern across the state about what districts are would be more likely? There is an absolute pattern. And, and, yeah. and so is it um, relative to wealth? Is it relative to? Initially, initially it was relative to farming. Farmers like income taxes okay. because property taxes, whether they have a good year or a bad year, they got to pay property taxes on their land. Income tax they only pay when they have a good year. And if you draw, if you kind of, if you think about it, if you draw the state into quadrants, and it's not quite even quadrants, along mm -hmm. I-70 and I-71, mm -hmm. if you go into that northwest quadrant, yeah. there are way more ta districts in that quadrant that have income taxes than don't. Um, it is very prevalent up there. Um, you go into the southeast quadrant and you have almost none. Mostly because there is no income down there. Right. There's no val property value either, but there's no income. Um, and so you don't have it. Um, and the rest of the state, in the rural parts, you get it. Um, in the urban area, you know, in the urban counties, as we look at urban counties, um, like there's three in Hamilton County, including Wyoming, which is also one of the wealthiest districts in the state. Um, there's none in Lucas County, but there, but Perrysburg, which is considered a suburb of Lucas County, but it's in Wood County. Uh, they are also one of our, you know, when you look at our 20 most similar districts, they are one of our 20 most similar districts. They have had an income tax for a very long time. Um, they are not prevalent up in the northeast corner of the state. There are none in Cuyahoga County. Um, there are a couple out in Geauga and Lorraine um, and Medina. Um, but not, they're not real prevalent up that way. And what's a typical kind of level or balance between property and income taxes? Is 1% pretty standard, or is there a lot of them less than that, or any there, more? Or? There is a range of them that goes from a low, <coughs> I think there's still a few districts that have a half percent, but not very many anymore. And they go as high as two. And actually, when I was looking at it not a couple weeks ago, and I guess I've been away too long from the Department of Taxation. There are way more districts that have 2% rates than I remember having 2% rates. Um, where, but basically what they've done is they've added. They, they, they did not, I don't think there's right. any district that, that, in to start with. that did 2% yeah. on their first try. That was going to be my question about like when they renew, I mean, are most of them permanent or are most of them like five year renew, like they renew the income tax or, and if so, do they go for increases and the, would we need to go for an increase or like could we just have a, you know, expect? I, again, whether, you know, the next time we need new money, which, mm -hmm. You know, maybe five, seven, eight years from now, depending on what option we choose. And, you know, obviously there's some, you know, things with our costs, like how, you know, what happens to our health care is going to make a big difference and things like that. Um, at that point, I mean, you have to choose, okay, we, if, if we need to add more money at some time down the road, do you want more income tax or do you want more property tax? I and mean, basically, you're back to the same discussion. Mm -hmm that we're having right now is with what route do you want to go at that point i think doing an income tax now or doing a property tax now i think does not change what happens however many years down the road it is when we have to when the board has to have this discussion again and i you know maybe the only difference is if we do an income tax this time and we are successful and people are more used to income tax, it's, it, right. you don't have the novelty aspect of it mm -hmm. that we have right now. But the decision is still, right. well, do you want income tax, or do you want you have more income tax, or do you want more property tax? It's still the same decision point, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really useful tool, though, right? And I would really like to see us find a way to, to have this in the mix. It's more sustainable long term. It does great things for business. It's there's so many really good reasons that I really think this would be effective. And I'm I'm supportive of an income tax, but I'm like cautious of like how we can make sure we're successful. And I think our message is right, right, but I know there's a lot of pushback about it, right? And I think when you start running numbers and things like that, individuals will like 
either have shell shock or just like kind of make it into this income versus property thing that's kind of, you know, <coughs> yeah, not it's, constructive. It, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we, we, Mike and I have kind of been out to some of the community members already to yeah. say, you know, listen, this, the, the situation we talk about, the five-year forecast, and a lot of people that are in the, the sim, a similar role as Mike in their businesses or their, their environments, they are almost always shocked at the funding model and, yeah. and, and how we are so heavily reliant on the tax base. And that continues to be exacerbated by the, the, the decisions down at the state house. And I don't think that's going to change. And so I think part of that, that conversation is the quality of the schools. But if you don't like things, talk to some of the decision makers outside of Granville um, around funding mechanisms. Because there has been a significant shift in the policy decision makers orientation towards shifting the burden to the local level. Local government, local schools. If you don't like that, communicate that more broadly. So get engaged, um, because it's been happening over the last eight years. <laughs> so, I mean, is that mm -hmm. incorrect? Yeah. Only the eight years. It's been happening longer. Than longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And it's more targeted at communities yeah. like Randall. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Reality, right. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think the the other aspect of this is. We continue to have people come to Granville schools, Granville because of the schools. And, and so we have to recognize, I mean, we, we enrolled some people today that were so excited to be moving in in a couple of weeks uh, to be in the school district. And um, you know, why did you come to Granville? Yeah. The schools. Yeah. Three kids, very excited. Um, you know. Our product speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. It really does. And it, you know, I, I will tell you that Mr. Bernas' phone has been ringing off the hook with districts calling us and saying, how are you doing what you're doing? Um, and I, you know, they're calling the right person because um, he's a large part of that. So that it is, we shouldn't be bashful about that at all with our community because I don't think they necessarily see that on a regular basis but um, I think we have to really share that that message how are you doing what you're doing or how are you doing what you're doing for the amount of money that you're doing it for or both or both yeah, yeah. I mean they don't usually call us because they see the financial side of things mm -hmm. but you know when we t communicate well, yeah. when we communicate to our public you you're darn right we share that information um, because that matters to them because that's the whole you know return on investment conversation okay any other thoughts concerns I mean I, I think like you said we're not hearing a lot in the community so I I think this discussion of income versus um, um, property tax is really again happening here and once we decide it's going to really yeah. they're going to really make a decision based on the message that we get so yep. yeah, I don't know point. that I don't know that they'll go oh well you know they could have done that so I'm not going to you know what I mean I don't know that right. that's going to come up as that's a yeah. um, um, a concern but anyway all right should we move on then yep. everybody's okay um, action agenda okay 10.01 uh, George a <laughs> <laughs> so second second yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about the therapy? So let me just voice yeah. my concern about George, is sure. that every kid, when he's introduced to them, knows that they will not have a hand in rearing George. Mm -hmm. I know coming from farm backgrounds and all that, a lot of kids are going to think that George is the mascot of the school. And I think it's got to be made very intentional that George is there to help A, B, and C. And you might see George, but you don't interact with George. Because mm -hmm. when a puppy rolls in, <laughs> Lord have mercy, <laughs> right? It's kind of crazy. Yeah. So I think okay. to just if the groundwork is laid for why George is there with everybody, yep. to make it intentional. Duly noted. Any other questions? The majority of the students who were so excited and the lovely 
are already going to lose the high school, right? They'll be knocking yeah. on Mr. Durst's door to get a dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is true. Yeah. Any other questions? I've seen the magic. I mean, it, you know, animals are not judgmental, and um, mm -hmm. people relate to them. So I think there's a lot to be said for this, and I applaud Mrs. Postal and the students for their work. Thank you. I take the roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. I apologize to my fellow board members, but I have to go. No, I have a new babysitter. Yes. Uh, Sullivan Whitehead, and I yeah. fear for him more than I fear for <laughs> <Yeah>. him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just really, really quick. Will you sign? This is for Carrie. Do um, you want all of them to just sign it for me? Sorry, okay. I meant to do that at the beginning of the meeting. Sorry. My hand raised. Sorry. Thanks, yeah. Andrew. Uh, Next item is 10.02, the approval of the consulting contract for Amber Gilsdorf. So moved. No second? I'll second. Uh, so we, Amber was our guidance counselor at the high school for many years. Um, because we have two new guidance counselors in the last two years, we have created a consulting contract to help with that transition. It's a one-year contract, really just to help with continuity. Okay. Kind of part-time and yep. so forth, right? Yep. The more we can keep her engaged, the better, and she does fantastic stuff. So, and as she's still involved in the industry and, and probably has some different insights, I'm sure that we'll benefit from. So, Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah, yeah she's mm -hmm. such a loss, mm -hmm. but not because she's. Yeah, there you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for? No. Okay, take a roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Okay. Ten point oh three is a contracted service agreement for uh, hearing impaired services. So moved. Second. I'll second. Thank you. It's, uh, Shana has been with us for several years now. This is our annual approval. Okay. Nothing particularly new about the contract. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Cornwell. Aye. <laughs> uh, 10.04 are the uh, is the second reading and adoption of or the approval of our uh, board policy changes. So moved. Second. 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 Amy. Go ahead. I'll second. Okay. Uh, I went through the majority of them at the last board meeting. Uh, 99% of them are related to legislative changes, specifically House Bill 49, which was, which was the budget bill. Was that an education bill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any uh, yeah. questions about any of the policies that we went over? Take no. the roll, please. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Janine? Aye. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, the consent agenda is 11.01 A through what? D. A through D. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, I want to call your attention to, uh, under leave of absence, um, you'll see that there is a three year unpaid leave. Um, that is related to um, she how can I say this without violating HIPAA or anything it, like that it's a requirement of SIRS it's a requirement of SIRS um, to meet but, the conditions that we're facing yes and she is no longer um, actively working for the school district um, but is part of the employee retirement system um, and so we have to fulfill this requirement <laughs> I can fill you in later <laughs> um, but it is it is something that is uh, in the best interest of the school district and and the employee anything else about the consent agenda that you wanted to have it? Uh, no, I yeah. just always appreciate the uh, donations and um, the field trip is uh, a potential field trip. 
Any other questions? No. No. Take the roll, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Okay. Financial um, agenda. Um, the September financial report. So moved. Um, I will keep this very brief. Um, there is nothing much different going on than there was last month. Um, every, everything is, you know, kind of on track. Um, a couple things, just one thing, the spending numbers are a little bit out of line right now uh, because of a, and you'll, you'll see benefits are up 10% over last year. And that is because of a mix-up um, where something that we thought we were being billed for, we actually weren't being billed for. We sent SIRS a check. They're sending it back to us this month. Um, it was something we thought we owed for, but it's actually part of a deduction that we get later on. Um, and so that's inflating the growth in benefits. Um, other than that, um, there is really nothing much that is going on. Revenues are not quite 4% ahead of last year. Expenses are about 4% ahead of last year. And again, that will come down a little bit. I think next, the, next, this month we'll get the money back from, from SERS. So we're, we're in line with where I would expect we'd be right now. Okay. Any questions? No. Okay. okay, take a roll, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. Um, 12.02 is we're actually just readapting the appropriation resolution for, that we adopted last month, and I will explain why we're doing that. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Um, this is because um, I. The money that we got, the $8,000 for from high school that works for PBL. We got that money late last year. We appropriated late last year. And I thought it had been encumbered before the end of the year, so we didn't have to reappropriate it, so I didn't. And then a couple weeks ago, I was going to some stuff, checking for some, re for, for some, um, some um, requisitions, and realized that it hadn't, it didn't carry over from last year. And so the, what we passed last month did not include that $8,000 appropriation. Everything else is the same on the resolution other than that, adding the $8,000 so that we can spend the PBL money. And that's the only difference. Any other questions? No. No? All right, take the roll, please. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Thank you. And then the, my final issue is um, the uh, extending the agreement with Rich and Gillis Law Group to do our property tax monitoring. So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Um, this is the renewal of the contract. It'll be the same hourly rate as we've paid in the past. Um, what they do is they monitor um, home set well property sales. Um, for us, they evaluate them. They make recommendations of whether we should challenge um, the price, yeah, the sale price, and whether we should challenge them. And also, if somebody else files a challenge against us, they keep us informed of that and make recommendations. Um, and that's their primary, the primary function is it. And they'll they'll do stuff with the reappraisal this year. They'll probably do some tracking with the reappraisal as well um, if there are any issues that they think are up out there. Um, they don't take any action without our approval. Um, they, they can send the recommendations to me. Um, other districts let their attorneys file without doing that. I think that's a bad practice. Um, and so they won't do anything without us first saying, OK, giving them an OK. Everything about the contract is so similar to it's rates? And it everything. is identical to the contract from last year. So is it really busy with this reappraisal? I imagine there's lots of ups and downs and motions and things like that and things. Basically, is that going to present or is that not really? What they're most likely going to end up doing is they're probably going to um, monitor appeals. So okay. if people yeah. who are appealing 
their values, and what they'll do is if they meet certain criteria, uh, they will alert us to the appeal, and we'll evaluate it and make a decision as to whether we want to counter the appeal or not. Any other questions? No. All right, take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Ms. Davies. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Motion to adjourn. There we go. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Take the roll, please. Ms. Davies. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Very good. Thank you.